All right, everyone. Well, welcome back. Uh, hopefully, you enjoyed the presentation from Emily and Christina. Uh, like I like I mentioned just at the end there, it's uh, it's always interesting to get Nakwa's perspective on all these issues because they're very uh, obviously very closely connected with a lot of utilities, uh, both clean water utilities and combined clean water, drinking water, storm water. So um, not only connected to the utilities, but also a lot of the EPA initiatives. Um, and so, so clearly a lot going on. Um, so taking this a step further, we wanted to flesh this out uh, in a bit more detail in a panel discussion, uh, this whole you know, a notion of addressing costs associated with regulatory changes um, you know, as, as Emily mentioned at the end, end there, uh, you know, it, it is a challenge. There's, you know, that, that's just what it all comes down to. There's uh, uh, constant changes happening uh, with, with some of these regulatory mandates, uh, and it does, it, it does become a huge cost consideration for, for water and wastewater utilities. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we want to get into on, on this panel. And once again, I, I, you know, like I've been doing, I, I, I again encourage anyone that has any questions uh, to please keep those coming and we will, we will uh, prompt those for our, our presenters, uh, get to as many as possible. So I would like to welcome in our panelists. Uh, first, we have Megan Glover, co-founder and CEO of 120 Water, Nicole Pash, Client Solutions Manager with Xylem, Kelly Tucker, Clean Water, uh, State, uh, she works for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund with the US EPA, and Nick Chamberlain, who is with the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, uh, the US EPA. Uh, so I'd like to go to each of you for some brief introductory remarks and just uh, give us a little bit on your, your background, your experience, and kind of uh, your, your current work as it relates to either regulatory issues or, or you know, kind of the funding side of that. So Megan, we'll, we'll start with you. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Andrew, and um, wonderful to be with you all today. I just wish it was in person. <laughs> um, my name is, again, like Andrew said, Megan Glover. I'm co-founder and CEO of 120 Water. And uh, 120 Water, for those of you who may not know, we're a digital water solution, so cloud-based software, uh, digital kits, and managed services that uh, state regulators and water systems use to execute drinking water compliance programs. So a lot of the programs that our, our customer use our platform for are lead and copper rule, lead service line inventory, a lot of emerging regulatory programs. And so, you know, I think um, our intersection with new regulations and funding is really, um, you know, I think we can all agree that there's um, really not enough people uh, nor, nor available dollars that a lot of both states and systems have to spend on uh, these regulatory demands. And so um, digital transformation and the optimization of processes and modern technology have to be a part of that conversation um, to really stretch and maximize the dollars and resources that not only our customers, but the entire industry has at their disposal. So um, that, that is where kind of my intersection and background come uh, to water is really building for enterprise modernization of technologies that help not only improve processes, but essentially at the end of the day, get work done. So, um, so that is kind of, uh, and applying that to water programs such as, uh, you know, Safe Drinking Water Act and others. So uh, that's my, a little bit about my background and 120 Water. Great, thanks, Megan. All right, uh, Nicole, come to you next. All right, well, thanks again for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So I am Nicole Pash. I recently joined Xylem um, as a client solutions manager, which is really just being that utility advocate uh, for digital solutions and optimizing what we can do differently today um, with you know, less funding, more challenges, and, and greater, greater emphasis for doing better work across the board globally. Um, so our team specifically focuses on digital solutions, um, much like Megan has uh, introduced here today. And we're really looking at those challenges sourced to watershed, so intake to affluent all around our community. Uh, previously to joining Xylem, I worked for the city of Grand Rapids for the last 14 years uh, in various roles inside the utility. Literally started as an intern in the lab, so worked my way up. My last position was really uh, leading the utility integration, advancement, innovation programs. So similar to what I do for Xylem, I was doing inside my utility at the city of Grand Rapids. So I know those operator challenges. I, I know those um, 
holistic community challenges and how to integrate them very well. I currently still reside in Michigan and I serve the Great Lakes region, Michigan, Indiana, and Ontario. Looking forward to our conversation. All right, very good. All right, Kelly, we'll come to you next. Hi, so I am uh, Kelly Tucker. I've been with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund Program at EPA headquarters for 15 years. Um, for those that might not be familiar with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, it's a low interest loan program for a wide range of water quality infrastructure projects. Um, the program is capitalized by EPA, but it is a state managed program um, in which the states are responsible for selecting the projects that receive financing. Um, the program is a partnership. Uh, so I work with the state programs both in an oversight capacity um, to ensure compliance with federal requirements, but also as a partner, um, helping them to share innovative ideas and practices uh, with one another for um, running their programs. My um, area of expertise within the program is um, primarily on project eligibility, um, but I'm sort of a jack of all trades and involved in um, many aspects uh, of the program at the federal level. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to talk more about our program, and I'm also really happy that uh, my colleague Nick from our sister program, the Drinking Water SRF, uh, is here with us as well. Yeah, absolutely. And with that, uh, Nick, we'll uh, finish up with you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so yes, I'm Nick Chamberlain. Um, I am the team leader for the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. So again, we are the sister program to our, our clean water colleagues. Uh, I've been with the program for about 12 years now, and my background is environmental policy and uh, business management as well. So the Drinking Water Program is a, kind of a bit of a mirror image of the Clean Water Program with a couple of, of notable aspects. Um, that are, are a bit different. We also not only capitalize, of course, the, the drinking water um, revolving funds, but we also uh, fund technical assistance um, and also support to the state primacy agencies to make sure that all of the non-infrastructure needs are also met as well. And um, you know, similar to what Kelly was saying, much of our work at EPA not only, of course, is the oversight of the state programs are, you know, and working with our state partners there. Um, but but fundamentally, to make sure that the programs are all working very well, and we're very focused on making sure that the dollars are getting out as, as much as, as many dollars are, are getting out into the communities as possible, particularly those that are out of compliance. Um, but of course, 93% of community water systems are actually in compliance. So we want to keep those in compliance. But it's of course, make sure that we're always keeping an eye um, and, and focused on, on, the, on the folks who are not in compliance as well. So again, some very multifaceted pro uh, program and uh, a lot of projects underneath that. So I'm um, yeah, very excited to be here. Andrew, thank you for the invitation and I'll turn it back to you. Absolutely, yeah, thanks, thanks guys for, uh, for all being here. Um, and, and you know, this should be a, a pretty wide ranging discussion. You know, when we we're putting this together, I kind of see uh, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll be proven wrong here, but you know, I, I kind of looked at this panel and we have, uh, you know, Megan and Nicole, you guys might be in a position where you might work a little more directly with utilities and, and kind of crossing over onto the operational side, whereas uh, Kelly and Nick, you guys seem to be, you know, closer to the funding side uh, with EPA. So I'm going to try and make sure I, I frame some of these questions so that we can all uh, address these. But, you know, just starting with a, a simple question that I, I brought up on, on our opening presentation, uh, which is how is really the, the current regulatory climate for water, wastewater, stormwater utilities, how is that essentially affecting the, their financial health? Um, and, and which of those sectors do you think is maybe being impacted the most right now? Um, and, and how is federal funding being allocated? Uh, um, so kind of a multi-part question to start off with there. Uh, Megan, do you wanna, wanna okay. tackle that one first? 
Sure. So, yeah, and I'll, I'll leave the regulatory funding up to the regulatory funding experts there. <laughs> but um, but I think from the, the operational and, and budget and then planning and particularly on, on the drinking water and the emerging emerging water, water quality, um, I think we all know uh, lead and copper rule revisions are, are top of mind. And as such, not only is there a water quality aspect, but there's an infrastructure aspect and an inventory aspect that um, leaves, is quite frankly, leaving the drinking water community a little bit um, of what do we do? You know, you have certain states uh, such as Ohio and Michigan who accelerated kind of their um, their own, you know, lead and copper rule revisions, but there is a lot of budget and planning that, that really needs to go into those revisions. And so I think on a capital planning and strategic aspect, we see a lot of utilities stalling a little bit, knowing that there may be a heavy lift coming over the next, you know, five to infinite number of years um, as it pertains to lead and copper rule and the infrastructure implications. And um, and then as, you know, all of the, the PFAS implications and, and really understanding what the burden of, um, of that's going to be on the system. So um, to say, I think biting nails and wait and see and, and really waiting for some clarity, quite frankly, so that, that we can um, start to really understand the budgetary and resource impact. So um, I'll, I'll kick it off there and then see if anybody uh, agrees or not in terms of kind of the wild, wild west that is pending regulations right now. Yeah. So Nicole, same. You know, your your thoughts on this, just in terms of the the the, the current climate, and you know how how it how these kind of regulatory issues affect the the financial health of utilities, and in particular, you know, area that you see being impacted the most. Yeah, that's that's hard to know. Um, I come from Michigan and a utility inside Michigan, which has some extremely strict rules and. If we're not first, I don't know who is um, on a lot of these environmental regulations. So PFAS, you know, I, I had to start a PFAS program out of nothing, you know, where you have to literally say, what is PFAS and, and go from there. And that started on the wastewater side and it's now reaching the drinking water side in, in Michigan. Um, and so really impacts your industrial procurement program and the requirements associated with that. And there's not a lot of I don't think federal funds or big project money for things that are generally OPEX regulatory compliance type programs. They're not, you know, CapEx investments. They're not large infrastructure. They're not uh, let's solve it by building something bigger type issues. They're really driven by data. They're really driven by humans and, and compliance and really understanding your economic environment um, of the community. So that's a challenge. Um, on the other side, you know, the drinking water side, we have lead line replacement. And that is something, you know, for years we all thought, well, that was private side, so that wouldn't be in our in our funding, in our, in our planning. And so how does that impact us? But more holistically is the integration of both of those and the health of your financial system as a community. So those regulations both impacting both sides of our utility at the same time puts the city and our, you know, our residents and our affordability complexes into even more of a focus of, of how do you look at integrated planning differently? You know, what more can we do by not only looking at integrating planning from stormwater and wastewater, but also the drinking water, because we're all in this as one community. So how do you go from there? So what are data ready projects is what I like to say. And, and let's let's start with those because those are the ones that we can get the most optimization for the lowest capex. Sure. And uh, and so Kelly, kind of addressing the the same same area, you know, from from your point of view, um, you know, looking at the utilities that uh, you know EPA is is regulating, but also you know. Uh, you know, helping fund in certain areas, you know, what are your thoughts on, on sort of the current regulatory climate overall and the, the areas being impacted the most? Um, yeah, so looking at, you know, where the federal, the federal and um, state funding is going, um, with the state revolving funds, um, it's important to remember that these are um, state managed programs and um, they're provided with a lot of uh, flexibility uh, within the Clean Water Act to uh, get the funding to the, the projects with the greatest need uh, within the state. So from a federal perspective, um, the Clean Water SRF can provide financing to projects that range from uh, the construction of publicly owned treatment works to 
stormwater management, um, the centralized wastewater systems um, and non-point source projects, as well as um, a variety of energy and water efficiency uh, and water reuse projects. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility there um, for uh, the project types with the greatest need um, to get the SRF funds. Um, it's um, also important to remember that it's not just the um, federal capitalization um, that is going to these projects. Um, the annual appropriation uh, uh, on average for about the uh, past three years for the Clean Water SRF has been about $1.6 billion, but we've provided about an average of $6.8 billion um, to projects. So there are the, the repayments and interest earnings as well as the state match that's being able to uh, get directed uh, to these projects. Um, in terms of where our money has been going uh, over the last several years, um, the majority has gone to um, secondary and advanced treatment projects um, at publicly owned treatment works. These are about, um, probably accounts for about uh, 3 billion or so um, of, of the funds each year. Um, we've also provided about a uh, billion dollars to CSO projects each year um, and somewhere around 250, million um, for both gray and green stormwater projects. There's also um, probably the remainder of that has probably gone um, mostly to various uh, non-point source project types, but that's a much uh, smaller um, piece uh, for us. The majority goes to, um, to gray infrastructure projects at uh, publicly, publicly owned treatment works. I did also want to mention that the Clean Water SRF has um, what we call the Green Project Reserve requirement, and it requires the state programs to provide a portion of the federal capitalization grant to um, green infrastructure, energy and water efficiency, or other environmentally innovative projects. Um, this has been a requirement of the program since 2010, and while these types of projects have always been um, eligible for um, Clean Water SRF financing. Uh, having this requirement does help to direct uh, additional funding to these types of projects. Um, then I'll let Nick talk a little bit um, more about where the funding has gone um, on the drinking water side. Yeah, Nick, go ahead if you wanna you know, address some of the same issues on the, the, the drinking water side. Absolutely. So, well, and what Megan was saying um, at the beginning here was absolutely right about, you know, there, there's a lot of uncertainty about the Lenin Copper Rule. Um, you know, we, the agency does um, we anticipate issuing the final rule, um, you know, this, this year, um, you know, and much of the, I guess certainly much of the infrastructure that is, uh, that's important, of course, for, for letting copper rule um, compliance is eligible under the DWSRF, like service lines and corrosion control infrastructure. And uh, I know we've seen an uptick in uh, those kinds of projects over the last couple of years. Um, and we actually anticipate particularly this, these next couple of, of years, we'll get, we'll see another big uh, influx of, of funding for, for that. There was a, something uh, called WIFTA, which is the Water Infrastructure um, fund Transfer Act, which actually allowed some of the clean water SRF dollars to be moved over to the drinking water SRF, specifically for lead-related projects that are DWSRF eligible. Um, so that provided a kind of an influx of, of uh, funds that actually don't need to be repaid. So I should back up and say the vast majority of, of money in both the, the, the revolving funds um, it, is a loan. There are, there are loans. Uh, there are, of course, the below market rate loans but they are still loans that need to be repaid. But there are some dollars within the fund that, that uh, essentially are grant-like dollars. So even though it's a loan, it's still, you don't have to pay the principal. So again, it's a lot, it's a lot like a grant. So we, uh, we know that there are, are several states that are taking, um, taking advantage of that uh, authority. It's a temporary authority. And uh, we'll see a whole lot of projects, particularly on the lead service line replacement side of things, um, a lot of a lot of projects that will be will be going on in that area, and uh, we also have a quadrennial needs survey. That's that's every four years. Um, it is uh, we've put that together since uh, the early excuse me the mid nineties, and one of the 
the very big pieces of our survey for the 2020 survey um, is a, a assessment of the, the cost of replacement of, of uh, lead service lines on both public and private property. Uh, and that was actually a congressional mandate from uh, just a couple of years ago, which which required us to do that for any any survey going forward. So um, yeah, I think that will give us a, an, a, an interesting sense of again, where where things are right now. And I think we'll also find out. Well, there are many. There will be many unknowns. There will be many uh, communities that simply don't know what the the service lines, um, what the composition of of them are. Uh, but again, we need we need that baseline. We need to have that understanding. Uh, but really, the the SRF is going to be I think a major, uh, sorry, a very important funding source for for those kinds of replacements, um, for, particularly for the service lines, but for for other things as well. And just to, you know to mention PFAS, since that's another kind of piece that's hovering in our, in our regulatory world, uh, that is something that is SRF, that's DW SRF eligible. So um, you know, any kind of treatment or you know works there that. Uh, that are, are necessary for, for compliance, even if it's just a state regulation. And I do want to point that out, that um, even in our program, while of course we have federal regulations, there's also state specific regulations that may, you know, may be even more strict um, than the federal level, or maybe where there is no federal um, uh, MCL, uh, maybe there is a you know, more, or there, there is a, a regulation at a state level. We can fund that so that the that the community can come in line with even a state regulation. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a federal regulation. Um, but again, that's and certainly these are I think certainly PFAS and lead are going to be two uh, two, two major major uh, just categories, if you will, of projects that we'll will be funding over certainly the coming at least the short term, but probably the medium term as as well in the drinking water SRF. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously, you know, you guys are you, you guys are getting into a, a, lot, a lot of different issues and challenges. And one thing that I think about kind of going into our next question is, um, you know, a lot of this regulatory policy, both on, you know, drinking water and, and clean water, um, you know, when you take a really overhead view of this, it really seems to have benefited uh, or, you know, in the long run, uh, you know, we've made a lot of progress. And you know, obviously, there's 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 terrible situations on say the drinking water like like Flint, um, but but by and large, um, you know, I, well, I guess that's that's somewhat up for debate. A lot of people think that there's you know there are there are, we do have a lot of aging infrastructure problems, but but by and large, people do get safe drinking water you know delivered to their homes. Uh, you know, there's been uh, a lot of environmental progress made over the years because of the Clean Water Act uh, and, and things like that. So uh, you know bringing it back to the, the challenges that utilities kind of face on a regular basis with with meeting regulatory obligations, what do you guys think those are? Are they, is it funding related or is it more operational? Uh, Megan, any any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's a, I mean, I think it's a very fair question. I, and I think it is somewhat localized. I mean, depending on, um, you know your the, the PWS size, how they're capitalized, um, private versus uh, rural. I mean, I, I think that that's what makes um, the regulatory climate, quite frankly, very um, volatile. Is maybe too 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 much of a word, but it, it's um, you know it, it, you have some you know utilities that have been preparing and are able to prepare and have been doing that for the last few years, and you have others that. Um, just simply can't afford to because perhaps lead's not an issue for them, something else is, but yet they know that they have to conserve and reserve resources for what they're, you know, either state or federally going to be mandated to do to remain in compliance. So, um, I mean, I think to, to answer your question, I think it, you know, that's a very localized question, I think, depending on uh, where you are across the country and then, you know, are you a, a large uh, system versus a rural system? But I, I think um, I think the common denominator, though, regardless, is this concept of do more with less and again kind of this need to use the regulatory landscape as a forcing function to to modernize and rethink processes so you know whether whether we talk to small or you know corporate utilities i think there is some sentiment that what we did in the 1990s right to comply with the original lcr might not get us where we need to go and it's a forcing function to at least have the conversation um, about modernizing systems and processes so i think that is a common denominator but um but i think uh 
in what order of events, whether it's budget, people, or uh, et cetera, might vary depending on you know where you are in the country and, and what type of utility you are. Sure. Um, yeah, Nicole, thoughts on this? Uh, just you know, kind of like I said, just the you know, what are the challenges with connecting these utilities with uh, you know the appropriate solutions, whether it's you know more funding or or an operational challenge. Um. Yeah, I think Megan really categorized all of that very well, but it is kind of local dependent. What what are you looking for and what are your challenges? I think Nick, Nick mentioned that, um, you know, when you're in non-compliance, it's almost easier to get funding to get yourselves um, ahead. And when you are maintaining compliance or you're maybe more forward thinking, it's almost more difficult to get funding and stay ahead. And so balancing that, I think, is incredibly important um, and that's really where I think Megan nailed it. It was doing more with less. You, you know, the ones that are forward thinking are those that are already trying to do more with less. And so how do you optimize further and, and go further with that? Um, yeah, solving that kind of funding uh, balance, if you will, I'll leave to Nick and Kelly, but I think there is this group of utilities in the middle that that could use the support to move forward. There's, you know, I think it's easier to get funding when you're small or large and have complex um, issues. But there's a group of utilities in the middle that have similar equity issues. They have similar affordability issues as those in big cities, and and they're maintaining on their own. But finding that creative financing is definitely a goal that we should all have. Okay, so Kelly, with that being said, you know, there are utilities out there that still, you know, face challenges and have a hard time dealing with them, whether they're financial or, you know, how do you, how do you guys at EPA, you know, in specific uh, to, to these, to the funding programs like the, like the SRFs, how do you guys view that? You know, I've heard, you know, it seems like, like I mentioned before at the, at the beginning of this question, there's, there's a lot of benefits that, uh, that, EPA and the, you know, regulatory um, mandates, you know, there's been positive outcomes, but I think this, you know, sometimes cities and mayors, you know, they, they think regulations are unfair or, you know, things of that nature. How, so how do you guys bridge that kind of divide, if you will? Am I unmuted? I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't see the mute button. Um, okay. So from, uh, with the SRFs, um, Nick sort of talked about it a little bit um, in the context of um, availability of some of this funding for uh, lead, uh, lead service line replacement. But the SRFs do have um, the ability, we're primarily a loan program, but we do have the ability to provide um, a portion of the funding each year um, in the form of uh, principal forgiveness or grants. Um, so there is, um, some additional subsidy that's available. Um, there's also the ability for SRFs to vary yeah. their interest yeah. rates um, uh, for, you know, for various reasons, um, for both the, the subsidy, um, the additional subsidy, as well as the interest rates. Um, a lot of times you see the SRFs doing this to help um, communities that perhaps could not otherwise afford um, to make these improvements to their systems. Um, but uh, another thing that we've seen that SRFs are doing is using the subsidy or perhaps um, using uh, a reduced interest rate as an incentive to, to, to bring communities in to, to finance um, certain priority project types. Um, in the SRF, you see it a lot with um, maybe energy efficiency projects or, or water reuse, water efficiency projects um, and green infrastructure on the clean water side. Um, and I, I think Nick could probably speak a little bit to this um, on the drinking water side as well. So there's tools um, mm -hmm. within the SRFs, um, you know, to help get the, the funding to either um, the, the communities that, that really need it, that can't afford, afford the loans or also to um, the certain project types that are really a priority um, yeah, within the state. And Nick, I'll let you talk a little bit more about that um, with respect to, to the lead service lines. Yeah, yeah, Nick, uh, go, go, go right ahead. Yeah, no, certainly. So um, well, specifically to what Kelly was just talking about with the lead service lines, um, you know, many states are, are offering um, 
either partial or full principal forgiveness, again, grant-like dollars for those particular projects, just given the fact that um, they're even, you know, even in every individual line, it's actually quite expensive um, when you think, gosh, it's just a one small fish mill that uses a couple feet on a pipe, but it's very, very expensive um, you know, to do all the labor and everything be, be, um, to, to go onto people's property and all that too. So again, that's um, one way to reduce the cost of, 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 of handling um, that, that particular issue. Uh, but I do want to also mention, or at least on the drinking water side, we have um, a lot of non-infrastructure dollars. So that is kind of what I was alluding to before. Uh, we call them the set asides. Uh, but that is, those are things like technical assistance. So uh, many states will fund um, both like planning and design grants for infrastructure. Um, some states will fund uh, circuit riders. Uh, many of them will fund a, uh, a consolidation grants or um, even just studies about okay, well, let, let's take a look at your source water and, and see well what what could potentially be be the problem there. Uh, so I think I mean if I if I were to talk to utilities who were kind of maybe on that edge, thinking oh geez, we we, we think there may be some issues. Our you know our consumer confidence reports are looking you know kind of on the edge there. We're we're close to hitting MCLs or we're um, yeah we're, we're we're kind of getting there. That would be I think a phenomenal opportunity for utilities to you know to come into the SRF and to say hey you know actually our infrastructure is just fine but we're we're still having these issues um, because again the, even the best infrastructure in the world if if you don't have a you know a, a certified operator if you don't have all of the other kind of non infrastructure components like the capacity the technical managerial and financial capacity to actually run the system um, then you you may actually still end up having problems even again with the best possible infrastructure uh, so there are just many resources that I think many utilities um, are just simply not even aware of. And we, I think when they think of the SRFs or, or maybe some other funding sources, they think, well, you know, the gray infrastructure, the treatment, the pumps, the pipes. Um, but we also fund, again, all of the kind of the soft infrastructure, the, the technical assistance. And we also have um, the, um, the agency funds uh, environmental finance centers that we um, very often send uh, utilities to, which we just got a message just the other day from a couple of communities that, you know, again, kind of are on the edge. They're, 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 un they're in compliance, but they're just really worried because they're probably aren't, aren't sure about their population, you know, numbers in the, you know, the next five to 10 years. Uh, so they're just kind of looking for options. And it's, I, I always, I'm always so excited to get messages like that because I'm, yes, uh, let's, let, let's do that now. Let's do that to be proactive. And, and and see what resources are out there, whether it's SRF, whether it's other um, you know uh, connections that we may have to to help the folks. And so I, I would say you know come in um, and because we are we're, we're, there's, a, there's a lot more um, to the SRFs than than just infrastructure. Sure, um, I I, I want to back up really quick and just ask a follow up to to, to Kelly and Nick. Um, you know, because we're, we're talking about a lot of different things here. Uh, you know, gray infrastructure and uh, you know water reuse. Uh, projects, uh, CSOs, um, you know, and on the drinking water side, uh, you know, lead and PFAS. Um, has, has there been any, um, I guess, any significant or notable updates in the criteria for uh, utilities applying for loans and who gets who gets approved? Um, and, and I understand that's kind of a, a, you know, could be a long winded answer, uh, but Kelly, is there anything in, in, to note on the, the clean water side, first of all, in terms of the, the, the approval criteria, I guess? Yeah, so the, um, the, the, the process for, um, for getting an SRF loan, um, it goes you know, through the state uh, SRF program, um, and the states, at, it's slightly different for clean water and drinking water, but uh, the, the states uh, rank um, all of the projects that come in and the states are able to set up their um, their ranking criteria. So they're able to you know, tweak it based on the the priorities within the state and, and states do use that um, to help raise certain project types higher uh, on the priority list for funding. So, you know, if, if drought is a major issue um, within within a state, they may give extra priority points uh, for projects that address uh, drought, so for water reuse projects or water efficiency projects or something like that. 
Um, with the Clean Water SRF, um, I guess in terms of the, the eligibility of the projects, we, we did have a big change and it seems like just yesterday, but I realized this was six years ago. In uh, 2014, we went um, from having just three project eligibilities, which were the construction of publicly owned treatment works, um, which does encompass uh, you know, a lot of, of different areas, um, the implementation of state non-point source management plans and um, the implementation of national estuary program comprehensive conservation and management plans. So we went from having those three project eligibilities to having now 12 project eligibilities. Um, so many of the new or new project eligibilities that we have um, were things that that may have already you know previously been eligible in the program. But I, I think it was it. It was a way to um, sort of highlight that these that these types of projects can come to the SRF uh, to receive financing. And some of these things were um, specifically like for water reuse, um, uh, storm water management, uh, decentralized wastewater treatment, those sort of things. So there are things that we could do um, before, um, but perhaps um, you know maybe people weren't as aware of it um, or. Um, some of the changes have made it a little bit easier uh, to do it. And there's um, some more entities that are eligible, for example, to come to the SRF for um, stormwater management, especially in um, uh, MS4 uh, regulated areas. Um, and then water reuse, it kind of opened the door to a wider range of <coughs> both public and private uh, water reuse. So, so that's some of the changes that we've seen over the last, um, I guess now six years. Um, but like I said, it seems like just yesterday. Still um, trying, the states are trying really hard to get the word out about these new eligibilities um, and that the, S the Clean Water SRF can be used for those things. Sure. And Nick, anything anything to add there on the drinking water type specific to uh, approval criteria or eligibility? Yeah. So the, the Safe Drinking Water Act requires the states, when, when they come up with their prioritization um, model, for all of the pro for when they get an application, they they rank projects um, based upon three major criteria. And the first is the immediate threats to public health. The second is um, safe drinking water uh, compliance, and through the third one is um, household affordability on a household basis. So the states take those three very major themes um, and they create a point scores, um, point scoring system uh, for, for all of the applications that come in. And uh, so, you know, over time, you know, there's, there is some you know, flexibility and changes that happen. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would argue that many, well, some, some states I know I've, I've seen give some, maybe some extra points when there is a new regulation that comes out because it's like, okay, well, we need to handle, we need to tackle this is the, this issue this year. I know there are a couple of states in, in our kind of our southwestern, um, actually kind of south central region uh, that gave uh, many extra points this past year and the year before that for the disinfection byproduct rule or the communities that were out of compliance with the DBP uh, rule just because of the incredible prevalence of, of DBPs in, those, in that particular geographic area. So again, there's a lot of flexibility that states have um, and most of them again are, are kind of, they, most of them kind of keep it relatively similar, but again, maybe perhaps give some points um, to to um, particular uh, contaminants or, or um, particular issues in, in certain years. But as long as they're kind of within the, that, there's three major um, overall themes. Okay, very good. Um, so, Megan, coming back to you next, uh, you know, and, and as you've kind of alluded to a little bit, you know, 120 Water, you guys are, are very much involved. Uh, and, and from what I know, um, just... Uh, you know, when we talk about some of these issues, it's more of a, you know, they're obviously trying to get funding to deal with a lot of, of these challenges. So, for example, lead and copper rule, um, but it's also a kind of an organiza or organizational question mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, like a, taking inventory of what their situation is, a, a lead inventory, so to speak, which is kind of where you guys come in. What do you, what do you see, though, as, as some of the, the big needs that you're seeing when you guys uh, kind of partner with utilities on various projects. 
Oh, um, lots of needs. I mean, I think, um, you know, what we see is, you know, these lead programs are now being consolidated and being one of the most cross-functional um, initiatives that a utility or community can undertake because it literally touches every, um, every function of the organization and also includes the citizen participation. And I think that's that's also the most interesting. Um, honestly, a lot of the gap that we see it's you know you know utilities are experts in infrastructure and, and water chemistry, but the interaction with the citizen to drive it from awareness of the program to consent of the program to coordination to getting you know getting information that they need from the customer before they can even validate a lead service line and then ultimately replace. I mean you know. It, it, it really is, you know, a, a thousand percent harder <laughs> than than it workflows and diagrams on paper. So um, to be quite honest with you, you know, I think a lot of our customers and when we're working with it, it's it's a lot of trial and error and um, a lot of um, innovative on things and, ha and getting enough freedom and buy in from stakeholders that are helping fund the programs that we may try something and it may not work and we may try again. Um, especially when you talk about using data and analytics to perhaps help pinpoint lead service line inventories before you send a, you know, a, um, you know, excavator out there to blind dig, which then in just incurs costs. So um, I think there is a level of, um, I know I'm kind of rambling a bit to your question, but this is how cross-functional it is. I think as a whole, um, C-level buy-in um, from why you want to perhaps innovate or try something different to contain costs down the road um, to ultimately make these projects run a lot more smoother, not only internally within your organization, but ultimately um, with your customer and the citizens that you have to interact with to ultimately um, get the job done. So, um, so again, we're seeing just a lot of complexity, not only internally, but externally. And then how are you continuously defining and reinventing your processes to make sure that it is scalable and uh, replicable for the entire lifetime of the program? Yeah, and, and Nicole, same same question. Obviously, you know, from from your perspective with Xylem, and also, uh, you know, just a, kind of a recently a, a former uh, utility. What do you see as kind of their biggest needs for addressing, um, you know, issues related to to regulatory mandates, um, and I guess um, challenges with implementing, you know, innovative solutions uh, to to some of these things, like like Megan alluded to. Um, yeah, I think it's a, a little bit of flexibility in the regulatory process. So if it's like a lead line inventory, why not also fund the AMI project? Why not go in, look at the service line, put the meter in? Why doesn't that connect to the CSO program? If we can do a water mass balance and we can look at the CSO program and prioritize from there, why does that not connect the stormwater and the water quality, you know, and... and and visually present water quality to the citizens and our community so that we can be present um, to, to our citizens and have that customer um, connection that Megan was so was alluding to. You know, utilities are out of sight, out of mind, and we've been that way for a long time. And without connecting to our customer needs, our citizen needs, you know, we, we have situations across the country where we don't do the right thing maybe at the right time um, because we weren't listening. And so I guess that's where I would like to see a little bit of changes in not necessarily that the regulation is a bad thing, but a little flexibility in how we get there and how we integrate and how we connect some programs so we can do more with less. Um, and it's not so siloed. It's not so built into the, you know, traditional cost capacity control confinement of can I do this? It's, it's then in the collaboration, the communication, the you know, the cross-functional aspect and, and whatever your triple bottom line of, of three things is, but we've got to get out of the control aspect and into the, the collaboration sphere, I think, in order to, to get some of this done, because there's a lot to do. Yeah. So, uh, you, know, you know, Kelly, do you have any, any thoughts on some of what uh, Megan and Nicole just talked about? I mean, are, are providing more flexibility, is that something that, that EPA looks at or something from your standpoint? Well, you know, one thing I did want to mention is that um, we talk about the the SRFs and, and you know the Clean Water SRF. Um, 
as a, a financing source for capital projects. But I did want to mention, I mean, I heard a lot um, uh, from them, from both of them about sort of the planning that goes into developing these types of projects. And the SRFs can be used um, to do uh, some of that planning work uh, where there's a reasonable expectation that it would result, that would ultimately result in a capital project. Um, so there's, there's states that, you know, we do, we, we can finance asset management planning and, um, and stormwater management planning and different types of assessments um, where you are identifying areas where there is a need um, to to perhaps do um, do a, you know, do a capital project in the future. So so I did want to mention that the SRFs, although they are there are financing tools for capital projects, but we we don't want to forget about the other the other part of that, which is the planning that goes into it. Um, the other thing is that. Um, uh, you know, as, as we're talking about how, you know, maybe some of these um, these projects can, can be integrated together um, for, for cost savings and more efficiency, the SRF, both of the SRFs can be used, um, you know, with other financing sources um, and even, you know, the clean water SRF and the drinking water SRF can be used uh, jointly um, together to, um, you know, to be able to put together a, a financing package um, you know, to, to best meet the needs of the community, to make it the most affordable, um, and to be able to cover the widest range of, um, of project types and, and, and eligibility. Um, you know, there's, there's pieces of um, a project that may be eligible for the drinking water SRF, um, you know, especially with the drinking water SRF set asides, there may be pieces um, that um, would, be, would be eligible well, for those that also may tie in to, you know, the clean water SRF where we could finance, um, you know, a, a different portion of the project. Um, and similarly, there's, you know, the USDA um, rural development grants, those, um, you know, also tie into it as well. So, you know, there's a variety of funding sources that can work together, um, you know, to help communities um, meet uh, the various uh, pieces, um, you know, that they need to finance. Yeah, Nick. Any thoughts on on this from from your perspective? I guess in terms of providing more, you know, more flexibility to you know the municipal level on on some of this. Yeah, I mean, one thing to kind of build off of what Kelly was just talking about. I know one place that is particularly, I guess, ripe for for innovative solutions and kind of cross programming, cross funding um, opportunities is uh, source water protection in, on the drinking water side. Uh, we actually have some some loans and some grant opportunities for um, for both source water assessments, uh, but then also actually you know buying land or buying um, or even doing um, uh, conservation easements as well. So and those funds can be paired with clean water SRF dollars. Of course, if there is a is a well, if there's a water quality aspect to it, which normally there normally there would be. Uh, downstream, of course. So I think that we've we've had a couple of projects like that already, where again, it's um, it's rather rather innovative. And of course, in in many, in, at least in some cases, you know, we're you know focusing on the, the source water is, is actually you know less. Uh, at the end of the day, it actually ends up being less expensive than you know, treating it downstream with gray infrastructure. Um, and we also had a community, and I was trying to remember what state it was. I think it may have been Minnesota, but just this past year. They um, they actually funded a drinking water treatment plant upgrade, um, and first of all, of course, it was for for drinking water purposes. Um, but they had worked, I guess, collaboratively with their their sewer department as well, um, because they were having issues with this particular contaminant in um, in the effluent uh, that was, of course, coming down the road there. So uh, it was I think it was a smart way of using and both funds to. I'm kind of using the drinking water SRF to uh, for a while for eventually water quality purposes. Uh, yeah, we, we certainly highly encourage people to uh, you know, to, to work together for kind of this out. That was definitely an outside the box solution to that issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so I I do I want to tackle. We do have a couple of audience questions coming in. Uh, both so far these appear to be a, a little bit more geared towards Kelly and Nick. So let me. Let me go through one more here, and then I'll and then I'll then I'll bring some of those into the mix. Um, you know, I I, I don't want to start uh, you know repeating ourselves here because we've we've gotten into this quite a bit, um, but I did want to ask everybody about lead and PFAS because they're two issues that um, 
seem to have just gotten a lot of, of, of media attention in, in recent years, obviously. Um, and, and so I, I, I just, I kind of wanted to, to dig a little deeper. I mean, you know, what do you kind of see as the, the biggest needs in, in those areas and, and what is kind of happening right now? You know, what, what, what has been done in recent years that you think has, has been in the right direction and, and uh, and kind of where do we stand now on, on some of this? So so Megan, go, coming back to you, I know you guys have gotten a little bit more involved in in PFAS issues uh, in addition to 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 lead and copper rule. Um, you know what 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 do you think overall the the water sector could could do better or to have funding better targeted to to some of these issues perhaps? Well, I think let, let's start with the example of good and, and hope that, you know, maybe other utilities see it as a worthwhile investment. You know, if we look at, I think, um, you know, examples in the city of Pittsburgh and proactively in Denver, um, the, just the sheer amount, they are now kind of executing their their uh, lead service line replacement program, but the actual investment in consumer communications and education, in addition to actually just doing, you know, getting the job done, uh, you know, in service of lead service, service line replacements, literally that's a wonderful case study that's gone from, they went from basically 100% distrust of management and um, oversight to a, a very kind of, you know, best of breed, well-run program across the country. So I think it's it's an example of, you know, the level in, of investment, you know, that happens if you kind of take a look at, you know, the outcomes, you know, if I'm building a, an organization, a resilient organization, um, you know, how do I how do I get citizen participation? How do I get my functions uh, communicating with one another? How do I, you know, what's the at right level of information. So I think um, I think that we have examples of good now that we didn't have five years ago, that it's going to make, quite frankly, the passage of the lead and copper rule revisions that much easier for those that can just take that playbook and run with it. And I think, you know, the same will be with PFOS as well, as we start to see regulations pass and programs and kind of best practice programs executed, having that playbook that now all utilities can run and, and follow, um, you know, thanks to those that have kind of engineered some best practices practices and we've seen, you know, demonstrable um, success through those uh, best, you know, use cases. So um, I see only positive. I think um, the downside is funding will perpetually continue to be an issue. And I think particularly navigating the losses from COVID, which we haven't talked about, but, um, you know, to, it's going to be, it's going to be very interesting. Um, I think over the next you know, at least three to five years to see what actually feasibly can get done um, in this new climate that we're going to be entering into. Sure. And uh, Nicole, what are your thoughts on whether lead, PFAS, or maybe some other, uh, you know, important issue that I might be missing? What, you know, what do you see as some some successful aspects in, in, in recent years or, you know, are we on the right track or not on the right track with some of these things? You know, I I like these two emerging issues, I guess, or, or well-established issues because it's it's shown what collaboration can do. Um, you know, PFAS is not just you know the wastewater problem, right? It's it's a community problem, and it was interesting to see our manufacturers come to the table and say, "What can we do?" Our research institutions come to the table and say, "What can we do?" The regulators come to the table, "What can we do?" You know, and and we have these collaborative projects on how to solve it. It's it's almost similar to COVID in that way where everyone's open about their research, open about what they're trying to do and everyone's trying to solve it together. Uh, I see a lot of that in the letting proper rule and the updates there. So I guess that to me is the good behind it all because we're doing the right thing. Everyone is not you know just dragging their feet and trying to say, well, when you mandate it, I'll do it. I think people are really coming together and saying, you know what, this is the right thing for our community. Let's let's get it done. Um, and hopefully, and, and I think I've, we've seen that is the costs come down when when more people are at the table and, and more ideas are are prevalent. Um, I guess so. Yeah, I'll just leave it there. That's the good I think that's coming out of this, and and I think we're going to solve the next thing, um, you know, in a similar way. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd, I'd like to circle back and maybe, you know, get some of your thoughts on, on, on COVID after, you, you know, if we have some time at the end, because, yeah, like you like you guys mentioned, that's that's something that we haven't gotten into a whole lot. Um, uh, but but Kelly, do you have any, uh, you know, sort of concluding thoughts on, you know, as we've been talking about 
lead and, and PFAS and some of these these high profile issues and kind of wh where we stand currently? Yeah, so the, the PFAS and um, issues, you know, generally they're they're talked about uh, on the drinking water side more so than on the wastewater side. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, from a clean water SRF perspective, you know, we could finance uh, projects to address um, uh, PFAS in wastewater um, at publicly owned uh, treatment works, um, you know, uh, innovative projects, perhaps um, those would be eligible. Um, but one thing I did want to mention um, that's a little bit more unique is that with um, with lead uh, service lines and 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 lead fixtures, more so with um, lead fixtures uh, in in public buildings, the um, the clean water SRF um, is able to actually um, address those um, to some extent. We had a project out, and I, I can't remember if it was in, in Washington or Oregon um, off the top of my head, but um, there was an issue, I believe it was in a school um, where there were um, uh, uh, fixtures uh, within the, the building, um, I think they were actually water fountains that had um, lead in them, and they were unable to uh, address it with uh, their drinking water SRF, but they they put in um, water efficient fixtures, uh, which are eligible uh, for the clean water SRF, um, but those new fixtures uh, did not contain the lead. So it was sort of an innovative uh, way um, to get, to use the, the clean water SRF um, to, to deal with the, the lead issue. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And, and Nick, I'll, I'll just come to you really quickly for the, the same question. Any, uh, you know, concluding thoughts on, on, on lead PFAS? Like, like Kelly said, I think these, you know, it, at least in, in terms of our, you know the the higher profile you know they they do seem to be connected a little bit more to the uh or they are more connected to the drinking water side of things but um you know any any concluding thoughts or or i guess um you know on on how we target funding to these types of projects mm -hmm. yeah i mean one of the I think the biggest challenge of course is is even just paying back some of these these loans or um, that's always going to be be a particular challenge with especially with lead service line replacements, um, given that you know, many of those service lines are at least partially on private property and, and are oftentimes at least partially owned by, by um, on, on the private side. So I think it's always, always a challenge. And we've had a couple of states who have been able to overcome that um, in, in various, various different ways. Uh, I think that's going to be frankly the biggest challenge is being able to uh, being able to have the utilities work on private property. I know there's always hoops um, to, to go through for to, to do any work whatsoever, but particularly with a, a, an issue like blood service lines, it is important to, to, to get, you know, get those to, to address those. Um, so but going back to what, what Megan had mentioned before, I think so much, so much of this is about communication. Um, you know, at having, if you're going to do a service line and replacement program or even corrosion and control infrastructure you know, at the treatment plant, um, it's so important to, to, to be very clear, open and honest with the, the, um, with, with the citizens who are, of course, who are drinking the water and uh, to be very clear again, well, what is the schedule? You know, this is, um, you know, the, this is, um, you know, what we. If, if you found lead, okay, well, this is where it goes down, and you know, just be very clear. Um, and about, and again, this is how we're going to tackle it, and it's going to take you know X amount of time. Um, and you know, this is again to be to be very very clear about that. And just kind of going back to what I think I was starting to say at the very um, beginning of our discussion here about our need survey. You know, when those survey results come out, I mean, we're going to it will show that there's a lot of you know there there are a lot of service lines out there that that um, that you know potentially need to be replaced. So I think you know when that when that information does come out. You know, it's important for the states and utilities to be to be ready to for for questions um, from from citizens. That will that will happen, and uh, I think that they will be prepared again as long as they're as long as they're just again open and honest and, and clear about about what it means. Yeah, absolutely. Those are those are some great points. Now, um, so for for Kelly and Nick, I, I just want to throw an audience question at you guys really quick because I think this is like I said, I think it's maybe a little geared a little bit more towards you guys, but. 
Um, is there a way SRF could encourage utilities to leverage their local bonding capacities to pay for traditional and innovative infrastructure investments? Because money is cheap right now, so to speak. So is that something that you could address, Kelly? Um, I mean, in terms of, of encouraging local communities, I think, you know, so the SRF, the Clean Water SRF has um, uh, a marketing initiative um, where a lot of where they, the, the state programs have um, gone out and done, you know, surveys and focus groups um, with, um, with communities to, to get a sense of um, why they do or do not come to uh, the SRF program. So I think, you know, in in that area, it may be an opportunity for SRFs, you know, just to also reach out to communities about, you know, what their uh, financing needs are and, um, you know, making them aware um, that the SRF, um, you know, is a, um, a low cost source of financing. Um, I think, you know, that's just, Kind of getting the word out there about the availability of the financing is um, is what the SRFs are able to do in that area. Nick, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, you know, given the fact that the SRFs um, they are typically half the market interest rate, although even though right now the market's interest rate is actually relatively mm -hmm. low, um, but again, even even that 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 relatively you know slice of a savings there that ends up being tens of millions of dollars. Um, and, you know, even to a small community that may save, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, that's that that is significant amount of money that is uh, that is saved from their from their budget. And they have to they still potentially need to raise rates if they need to, but maybe not quite by as much. Um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, that, that's that's um, yeah, I can't think of anything else. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, let's let's just kind of go back around, and you know, I'd I'd like to get all of your thoughts, and uh, you know, I, well, well, first of all, for our audience, if there's any other questions that anybody has, uh, you know, feel free to to, to submit those, and um, I'm kind of looking to see if we get any others in um, that might be good for for each of our panelists to address. But um, yeah, we uh, you know we we brought up COVID a couple times, so we might as well go go around, and and I'll ask each of you about that. Um, this, you know, it's it's come up in in our, our panel discussions for our, our earlier sessions of this conference, and I I kind of joke that we could probably you know we could almost talk about every issue in the context of COVID and the impact it's had, uh, you know. But I guess what are you guys seeing in terms of the the, the impact right now to utility operations? Um, our, our opening presentation today, uh, Emily and Christina, they they mentioned the uh, you know, I think the, the most notable thing on the finance side of things is the, the revenue loss to utilities somewhere in the ballpark of 12 to 14 billion for both drinking water and clean water utilities. Um, so, so Megan, obviously from your, you know, your conversations with, with utilities, what do you see as kind of the, the big impact so far? Yeah, I think utilities, again, back to being localized, are really trying to quantify what uh, what the revenue loss is going to be um, uh, now and then obviously annualized for the next, you know, uh, handful of years. And then also how that materializes in cutbacks to um, planned or in progress uh, capital expenditures. I mean, we've at least on our side, unless it's a, uh, a mandated capital expenditure or one that's nearing completion, we've seen a lot of you know stalled stalled conversations until they they really understand the impact. I think the latest the latest average I saw was what five five billion uh, in um, reduced capital expenditures across the board. So, you know, I think. Um, you know, again, I, I, I think I think organizations are, are just going to have to stall and try to figure figure out their economics and 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 prior and, and prioritize their dollars as best they can, and and hopefully we we see some um, some more relief above and beyond what the SRF can provide because um, between the regulatory challenges and the 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 impact that COVID has had on the industry, um, I, I hope that that the industry might be able to get some relief from from some other fashion as well. Yeah, Nicole, uh, what are you, obviously with Xylem being one of the largest manufacturing companies in the industry, I'm sure you guys have had an interesting perspective on, on all this. 
Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, Xylem is a large supplier, but it's really turning into a solutions provider. And so where we see maybe some decreases in, in purchasing of large equipment, we're seeing more adoption on the solution side of things. So how do we get our sewer operators and our maintenance crews out of the sewer? We don't know if the virus, you know, we didn't know the virus was aerosoling inside the utility. I still worked in the utility at the beginning of COVID, so it was uh, an interesting time. Um, and so those are the types of digital solutions that we offer. And that's really what we're, those are the conversations we're having with utilities. And they may be stalling on some large CapEx right now because they just don't know what the long-term ramifications of, of this revenue loss are. Um, and then same kind of with that finance question before are, can they be inclined to bond not if their debt coverage ratio is tight, and that is really where most utilities are, are riding that line of their debt coverage ratio. And so without knowing what their future revenues are, they're not going to be as inclined to bond out as, as I think you would think, I guess, as a consumer and looking at that market. That's just, that's not where utilities, I don't think, are falling right now. Um, so that's something to consider. But yeah, so that adoption of of digital solutions, the solutions providing, the, the, the look into what can we do smarter um, and, and less hazardous. So your continuity of operations planning is changing from all hands on deck to no hands on deck. And what are the, you know, what are we, what are we able to provide in that kind of arena to change how utilities operate in the future? Um, you know, we were fortunate inside our utility that we had automated, you know, treatment process. We had an automated sanitary sewer system. We had an automated, you know, storm system. We had smart systems everywhere. So we literally looked at each other and said, those systems are going to be smarter than we are right now. And that is really odd. It's an odd feeling. But because manufacturing is shut down, those, you know, those flows aren't going to be what we're used to seeing. They're going to be different. And we've got to treat these models as though they're the pros. Um, and I think that you're going to see that shift in how um, utilities operate. There were definitely the early adopters, you know, um, but I think they're going to get to the masses now is, is where I see things. Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask you, Nicole, kind of as a follow-up. Yeah, what do you, you kind of see that increasing in the future, more technology adoption for, you know, resilience and, and things? You know, I, somebody made a comment actually on our, our panel last week that it's, you know, maybe you can kind of look at that as a positive right now. I mean, imagine, you know, if it, this happened, uh, you know, 25 years ago. Um, but, yeah, you, you kind of see that tech adoption increasing. I do, and, and I, you see that integration or the integrated approach to everything more and more. Um, and so, yeah, now's the time, right? Everyone is fresh in their adoption of tech. Everyone had to quickly, um, you know, from my second grader to the, their teacher to, you know, my boss's boss. So they all had to adopt really quickly. And so I think now's the time to definitely leverage that because you you got that culture and that's the one thing that's the hardest to build and it's mm -hmm. here yeah kelly any thoughts on on covid and you know from your guys perspective with the you know with the srf program you know wh what have you seen as as kind of a big impact um so from, you know from the beginning um we have been checking in regularly with uh the state programs to uh, see if they have you know, seen any impact um, on the community's ability to repay their loans. Um, the majority of the SRF programs require um, payments, debt service payments to be made um, on, you know, twice a year uh, basis. Um, the, the timing of those kind of varies um, from uh, state to state. So uh, when we first checked in, um, it was it was too soon um, to tell to really see anything because the payments hadn't been due at that point. Um, we checked in again um, uh, fairly recently. Um, it was uh, sometime in uh, July. We we checked in with everyone um, again uh, just to have the conversation as a group. Um, and again, it, it's really been still a little bit early to tell um, what the impact will be. The, the states really aren't reporting um, many communities um, who have been having difficulty uh, making their, their payments to the SRF program. Um, 
I, I think they're, they've, they've said that there have been um, some communities that have approached them, I think sort of proactively, um, you know, discussing different options and, and what they can do if, um, if they do challenges. But, um, you know, for the most part, what we're hearing is, um, is that there hasn't yet been an impact, but, but they are, but the SRFs are anticipating um, that, that as this stretches on, um, there, there will be, um, uh, issues with community's ability to repay. I mean, another thing that we're looking at too is uh, how this will affect borrowing uh, moving forward. Will the will will people be coming to the SRF um, for loans uh, to do capital improvement projects? Um, there have been a number of of large loans that have been signed um, since this all began. So those communities are moving forward. Um, but but you know, it, as we as we move forward, it, it's um, I, I think we, we we're unsure of where um, where this is going to end up. Um, the other thing that we've been keeping an eye on is um, the the staffing and the budgets um, with the state governments for our programs. They're state run programs, um, and a lot of states are having furloughs right now. Um, you know, due to the financial situation uh, in the state uh, government. So um, the ability for um, for, for those states to continue to manage their SRF programs, um, you know, is something that we are trying to pay attention to um, because they're getting stretched really thin um, with reduced staffing um, and ability to to make additional loans um, and to to manage the loans that they do uh, currently have outstanding. But I think you know it's it's really something that we have to wait and see. We just don't know at this point in time. Definitely. Um... Nick, your your thoughts on, on on COVID and and the impact, and you know, from again from your perspective with the uh, the drinking water side of things. Yeah, well, there were two major indicators that we've been perhaps informally using to kind of take the temperature of where where we are with COVID and and how borrowing and kind of going, things going forward um, are, are going. And Kelly mentioned the first one, which is. Um, you know, are, are people, are, are the communities and the utilities, of course, are they are they still paying back their their loans? And by and large, yes, they are, which is which is which is fantastic. Um, the second one is well, kind of looking forward, are the communities, are the utilities, are they are they still applying for new loans? Um, kind of how how has that gone? And, and largely, again, communities, uh, the utilities, still seem to be applying um, at relatively the same rate as they were before in most states. I'm sure that there are some where it's, it's dipped. Um, but, but again, we're hopeful, at least at least at this point, that, you know, things look okay. Um, you know, it may not be a very robust, <laughs> you won't, well, may not be quite as robust as it has been in the past in terms of lending, um, but it, things look okay right now. I think just given the fact that, um, you know, we do have such low interest rates with the program and the availability of the grant like dollars. I think it's just it's an attractive place to potentially look. Um, and the one other thing I'll mention, we have we have states that go out and uh, leverage their program. So they sell bonds to um, to make more money available to the local water systems instead of the local water systems going out directly to bond themselves and benefit, of course, the state of the benefit of the state doing it is that they typically have a much higher bond rating, um, so they certainly get um, you know get less. Um, you know, the, the fees are fees are much much uh, smaller, and we've had actually a couple of states this year who actually have leveraged for the first time because they're actually trying to take advantage of the very very low uh, rates that are, are out there. So again, it's kind of a it's an interesting uh, dichotomy, if you will. Um, but we, there may be some states that actually and lend up more this year because of that, and then we may have some states that will will kind of be pulling back just a little bit. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, and on the at least on the drinking water side, we we make loans of almost all size. We last year we made an eight hundred and twenty five dollar loan um, to a small community in California for that had an arsenic issue. Um, I think it was a planning and design work with with them, all the way up to I think there was a two hundred and fifty million dollar loan for the city for New York City, and that was a part of a ten or fifteen year you know two hundred fifty million dollar each year kind of loan. So we kind of do everything uh, and, and, and small, large, and everything in between. Um, and that's how, hopefully we're, again fingers are, are crossed that it will continue uh, going that way. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. Well, I think that's a good. Uh, I think that's a good stopping point. We we certainly covered a lot. Um, 
So, I, I mean, I, I really appreciate everyone taking the time to join us. Uh, Megan, Nicole, Kelly, Nick, it's been a pleasure talking with you guys. Thanks again for taking the time. So just to, just to wrap up, um, I do want to mention to everybody that's been on these, uh, these sessions with us uh, thus far for the, uh, the Water Finance Conference, uh, when it's all uh, wrapped up after, after session four on Thursday, uh, we will have these sessions archived on the website, which is very simple, waterfinanceconference.com. Uh, we've had some questions about uh, archive sessions, so you will be able to access that after the fact. Um, and, and people who were not registered for the conference can can do that after the fact to, to view everything. Um, next week, or I'm sorry, on uh, on Thursday uh, for session four, uh, our, our our final session for the conference this year, we are going to get into uh, have a discussion about consolidation, regionalization. Uh, and privatization, we will have a, an interesting panel discussion kind of on, on public versus private uh, kind of metrics for, for perhaps uh, looking at a, a privatization model utility and, and some of the benefits uh, with the investor-owned model. So that should be, uh, we have some proponents, I think, for, for, for both. So that should be an interesting discussion. So looking forward to having everyone back. And uh, for now, we'll go ahead and sign off. Thanks again for joining us, everybody.